The current technology for displays involves a two-dimensional surface. Some displays actually use two two-dimensional surfaces to create a stereographic view, giving the illusion of three dimensions. However, true three-dimensional displays would require something called holography. Now, holography is different from a photograph. When we record a photograph, we take some object. In this case, we have the arrow representing the object, and this object is three-dimensional. We project the object onto a photographic plate or some type of detector, and this creates a two-dimensional projection of the object in the form of an image. Now, we lose a lot of the information. Basically, what we're doing here is we're only recording the time average electric field. We're recording the intensity as a function of position in two dimensions. Quite a bit of information is lost. Most importantly, the phase information is lost from the original object. Now with a hologram, we retain this three-dimensional information. A hologram basically preserves the wave fronts rather than just the intensity information. This gives holograms to basically retain parallax in the horizontal direction and in the vertical direction where we can actually see the object move as we change our perspective, as we change our location. If we move the hologram or we move our own location, this object will appear to also move as if it were a real object with regards to our vision. Now, the idea for a hologram actually was developed in the 1940s. Hungarian scientist by the name of Dennis Gabor invented the hologram while working on the electron microscope. The electron microscope uses magnets as lenses to focus the electron beam. They're called quadrupole magnets, and unfortunately, they in introduce a large amount of spherical aberration and other aberrations to the image. Gabor used the interference pattern from the electrons to produce an optical image. He basically took the phase information from the electrons, manipulated it to produce an optical interference pattern, and then restored the optical image and corrected for the aberration. Now, his work on holograms won him the Nobel Prize in 1971, but at the time of Gabor's invention, the only way that he could produce a hologram and not of great quality was to use line emission from a mercury lamp. And again, due to the limited uh, coherence of the light, um, this is a very difficult thing to do. Now, to create a hologram, we need coherent light. We basically need light where we illuminate the object with coherent light, with monochromatic light. And from that illuminating beam, the object reflects light in all directions, producing this wavefront, um, which propagates. We then use a reference beam of the same light. We basically split off the illuminating beam into a reference beam. And the interference between the reference beam and the wavefronts from the object produce an interference pattern, which is then recorded on film. It's very important to note here that the interference pattern has details that are much finer than the details that we have in a typical photograph. When we want to reconstruct the hologram, all we need to do is to shine light through the hologram or shine light through the exposed film and reconstructed wavelet wavefronts will be produced, and as we look at it, we will be able to see the original object as a virtual image. Now, to get an idea of how these interference powder fringes look, consider the light coming from a point source. The light coming from a point source produces spherical wavefronts. Now, I haven't shown a plane wave here, but if I look at the interference of a plane wave, interfering with the spherical waves, we will get this pattern right here, which looks like a bullseye, okay? A high quality in, a hologram has to record very, very small detail here, very, very small interference patterns in order for the hologram to reconstruct the original wave fronts from whatever source that we're using. Obviously a point source is as simple as we can get. A more complicated object 
will have a more complicated interference pattern. Now, the popularity of the hologram exploded in the 1960s with the invention of the laser. These holograms, again, were monochromatic because the laser light was monochromatic. And uh, unfortunately, the only way that you could view a hologram would be to use the original wavelength to illuminate the film. So to create the hologram, we again would split the beam off. We would have the laser beam uh, shine through um, a diverging lens and then shine onto the object to illuminate it. Then we would use a reference beam. These two beams would be combined back on the holographic film. And after this was exposed, we could use the reference beam again to illuminate the holographic film and we would see the original object again as a virtual image. Unlike a typical photograph, however, it would retain all the three-dimensional information that we had from the original object. That means that if you looked at it over here as opposed to here, you would see the object slightly rotated and slightly in a different position. Now, rainbow holograms are probably the most common type of hologram that we see today. These are also known as Benton type holograms and they were invented by Stephen Benton in 1968. These holograms made it possible to view a hologram without using laser lights. Lasers were very expensive at the time of their invention. So it wasn't very practical to use these holograms that required laser light. Now, one of the problems with these holograms is, although they work well with white light, you're basically giving up some of the information. You have the spatial information or the parallax information in the horizontal, but what we eliminate is the vertical parallax information, which means that if you move left to right, the hologram would appear to also rotate. If you move up and down, you wouldn't get that parallax. How these rainbow holograms are produced, typically they're produced just like a regular hologram with the difference that the object light is passed through a slit. And again, this eliminates the vertical information. We just get the horizontal uh, wavefront information. But again, this allows us to view this in visible light. Most of these holograms are actually recorded and then embossed. Uh, basically what they do is they take the hologram and produce a three-dimensional relief of it and then press it into some other object to produce the, op the hologram. Oftentimes it's foil to produce a reflective hologram um, or it can be some type of transparent material uh, which is then coated. Holograms are very good for security because they're difficult to produce. Um, extremely high detailed holograms, as we said, we, we require the interference pattern to be on the order of the wavelength of light. So in some cases, a very sophisticated hologram might require something like electron beam lithography, which is similar to the way that we make microchips. Once we create a master die, this can be pressed into foil and reproduced again and again. It's very difficult to counterfeit. Obviously, no printer is going to be able to produce a hologram, at least the technology that we have today. There's no holographic printers. So really, in incorporating these holograms into uh, currency, into credit cards, into whatever you want to create uh, security for, uh, makes it very difficult for counterfeits. Holographic storage basically uses the idea of holograms or using the interference of these wave fronts to store massive amounts of data. We already store data on optical disks and optical disks in some cases can store gigabytes of information. Holographic storage, when it was being developed, actually had the capacity of storing terabytes of information because of the much finer detail and uh, the, the sophistication of the way the wave fronts were stored in volume rather than just in terms of surface. Unfortunately, holographic storage has not been commercialized to this point. The company Inphase, which was working on it, went bankrupt, and uh, there's still a technology 
that uh, has yet to be realized. The most promising materials is lithium niobate. That's this transparent material right here, which uh, when doped with some types of impurities um, produces metastable states where you can uh, write the hologram right into the material. But again, um, holographic storage is not competitive with the current uh, storage materials that we have today. True color holograms. Most holograms that we see today are monochromatic. They have a single wavelength of light, and that single wavelength of light is from the light from the original laser. Now, the rainbow holograms that we saw earlier did produce multiple colors, but the information that was present was only the color information from that single wavelength of the laser beam. True color holograms have been demonstrated, not of high quality, but have been demonstrated. One such group in Japan was able to produce a hologram of an apple using a thin layer of metal. And uh, what they did is they created this hologram. To be honest, I can't say I completely understand the technology, but they used something called plasmons on the surface of this very thin metal. And uh, they were able to create it with multiple wavelengths of laser light. And this, this basically produces a hologram even in, in white light. But again, the quality of the, the hologram uh, still is uh, not all that great. And this has not been adapted for any commercial applications to this point. The holy grail of all holograms is a dynamic hologram. And what do we mean by a dynamic hologram? We mean a hologram that acts just like your television or computer display, where it can change in real time. This would be a three-dimensional image, which could be projected and then viewed by an observer or multiple observers. Now, we have to stress we're still at the point the, of, well, really the infancy of this technology. It requires a tremendous amount of computing power. Basically, we have to use the computers to predict what the wave fronts will look like and therefore what type of interference patterns are going to produce. So an, a very large amount of computer processing power is required for this. They also require extremely high resolution recording devices and extremely high resolution playback devices. Remember, when we're looking at a typical display, the pixels are very small, okay? Maybe there are a few tenths of a millimeter, maybe a few tenths, tens of microns. Holograms require detail much, much smaller than that, okay? They require detail which is smaller than even a micron. So when we're talking about extremely high resolution recording devices, extremely high resolution playback devices, we're probably talking about two orders of magnitude, 100 times greater resolution than even some of the best displays that we have commercially available. All right, so how do we produce a dynamic hologram? Um, here, a monochromatic dynamic hologram is uh, shown, and this uses micro mirrors. These are tiny little mirrors which can be rotated back and forth. It's, a, it's an array of these. And we shine the light on this, and the computer predicts what the wavefront should look like, how the mirror should be steered to produce the shape wavefront that they want, and then we project the image to wherever we want to view it. Again, the problem with this is we need a very powerful computer, okay? We need this micromirror projector where the micromirrors themselves have to be extremely, extremely small but at least we're beginning to demonstrate this technology. Now, this micro mirror array, again, would need these micro mirrors, again, on the order of about a micron or less. And um, they would all have to be addressable where the computer would individually rotate these mirrors um, to different angles to produce, again, the wavefront that would be desired. 
Now, here's a technology that I have to say um, impressed me, but I really don't um, completely understand it. Um, oh, by the way, let me before I, I jump to the jump to the new technology. Um, here's one way I could envision this micro mirror array being used uh, to produce a real color image. We could have uh, different lasers of the different colors that we see, red, green, and blue, just like a traditional LCD display. These would shine onto micro mirror arrays and then be projected to the observer to see um, this dynamic hologram. But again, uh, as far as the uh, technology for this, uh, these micro mirror arrays have been used in projectors in movie theaters, um, and uh, they've done quite well. But again, we need a um, resolution much greater than we get from typical uh, two-dimensional projectors. And let me again emphasize, when you're looking with those virtual reality goggles, those are two two-dimensional displays. Those are just two-dimensional displays, um, one for the right eye, one for the left eye, to give you the impression of three-dimensional uh, viewing, okay? It's not real three dimensions. Now, Lightfield Labs, um, which is an outfit that develops something called solid light, claims to have created and has demonstrated a uh, hologram display technology they call solid light. And uh, I actually watched a video of this. It's, it's pretty impressive. They're, uh, they use a chameleon here to uh, demonstrate um, this technology. And uh, what go on their website and they'll, they'll tell you that uh, there's a this proprietary display, which means that they know how they did it. They're not going to tell you. Um, and then some some other um, optical devices that they place in, in, in front of it to help shape the wave fronts that you see. So that when you're looking at, let's say this chameleon right here, the image is actually located in front of the screen. Now, you know, when you look at uh, a television monitor, you look at a computer monitor, you are looking at the image which is on the surface. So this projects the image in front of the actual surface and uh, you can put your hand out and this, what they call the solid light projection is uh, sitting between you and the projector, okay? Now, again, this is something that has been demonstrated. It has not been brought to commercial use. There's no um display that you can buy which uh, produces these three-dimensional holograms the display uses about 10 to the 10 pixels per square meter okay um to give you an idea that means a display that's a meter by a meter would have a hundred thousand by a hundred thousand pixels in it okay their display that the that they demonstrated was about a was about uh, a foot by a foot or 0.3 meters by 0.3 meters. Um, and they claim that you can put multiple displays together. So this is an emergent technology that um, at least has been demonstrated. Looking at the hologram, of course, I was watching a video, a two-dimensional video of a hologram, which you know doesn't uh, necessarily give you the, the whole um, experience. Um, it doesn't give you anything close to it. But what I noticed is the image was somewhat fuzzy. I, you know, I don't know if it was just the way it was being recorded or uh, whether it was intrinsic to the actual three-dimensional hologram, uh, but it, it still looks like this technology um, isn't uh, fully mature. And if it were mature, I would, I would expect a commercial product by now, okay? So that's the future, again, this is a technology that was developed first in the 1940s, became bigger with the advent of the laser in the 60s and 70s. Now we're seeing it all the time in these embossed rainbow holograms, which are uh, used on credit cards and used on, on uh, currency. But again, 
you know, when we think about the future of displays, the future of displays would be a holographic display, one that would reproduce the wavefronts just as a real object would do, okay? Now, it has to compete with existing technologies. Yes, we don't get that from a two-dimensional display, but these headsets that you can put on with two two-dimensional displays give you the illusion, the illusion of stereoscopic vision or give you the illusion of, of three-dimensional vision. They're rather inexpensive to make compared to these holographic projectors. So um, we'd have to have an experience where these holographic projectors would be far superior to those, those uh, virtual reality goggles um, and still be price comparable, I think, before uh, we'd really see this this technology uh, take off. My opinion, though.